Today's flight readiness firing marks the seventh time the KSC team has performed one of these tests. This will provide an opportunity to test critical elements of the shuttle as a fully integrated vehicle in the KSC launch environment. It provides confidence in the performance of the vehicle systems. The test objectives include assessing the integrity and performance of the main propulsion system of the orbiter, the main engines, and the external tank. Engineers, engineers will establish leak values for Endeavour's main propulsion system. All orbiters have a minimal amount of acceptable leakage. Actual performance will be assessed of all vehicle elements and supporting pad systems. The launch team has completed loading the external tank of its propellant. The tank is fully loaded at this time of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen cryogenic propellants. Several tanking tests have been conducted. We had a built-in hold of one hour at the T-minus one hour and 20 minute mark. Engineers are analyzing data. We've got about 50 pieces of instrumentation in addition to the normal sensors that are used for launch, and they are installed on the shuttle vehicle and mobile launcher platform in strategic locations. The sensors provide engineers with important data such as temperatures, pressures, and leakage in the aft compartment. The launch team is analyzing parameters during the test, and they will analyze this information after the firing today. The countdown here for the flight readiness firing matches that of a standard shuttle launch countdown. However, there are a few obvious differences. For example, the flight crew is not on board Endeavour during the test, and pyrotechnic devices used to ignite the boosters are not installed. In addition, software inhibits have been placed to prevent the ignition of the two boosters. Members of the launch team are in firing room one here at the launch control center, and we have a support room, firing room two, also manned for this test. The necessary members of the mission management team are at their consoles here in firing room one in the operations support room. Some members of the flight crew are already here in the launch control center. We expect to have the full STS-49 flight crew here in the control center for the test. All activities have been going according to plan since the countdown picked up at 2 p.m. on Friday at the T-minus 43 hour mark. The crew hatch on the Space Shuttle Endeavour is closed for the test and people have been cleared out of the launch pad area and no will be allowed in for the flight readiness firing today. All is going well in our countdown and the clock is now at T minus 36 minutes, 20 seconds and counting. This is shuttle launch control. Columbia, can you verify? Clear caution and warning memory. Columbia Houston, would you verify that your yaw steering is inhibited? Affirmative, it is inhibited. COS, COTC. Go ahead. Got to go to set up your uh, star stern plotter. Copy that, it's going to work. And LPS, you copy? LPS copies.
APD OTC. Yes, APD, go ahead. Check next pre flight bike. All right, 423 and work. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus 29 minutes and counting. Counting now down to a hold at the T-minus 20 minute mark. That hold will last for 10 minutes. It's a planned built-in hold and it's standard and a shuttle countdown. The start of the main engines will be identical to launch. They will be tested at 100% of rated power level. At T-minus 6.6 .6 seconds, the ground launch sequencer will issue the main engine start command. There will be a staggered engine start sequence as is standard. Engine 3 will be started at T minus 6.6 .6 seconds. Engine 2 will be started at T minus 6.48 seconds. And engine 1 will be started at T minus 6.36 seconds. They are all started about 120 milliseconds apart. This is a normal engine start sequence. The cutoff of the main engines today will be initiated by an induced launch abort. The orbiter's onboard general purpose computers will detect a failure and will command shutdown of the number one engine about 19.4 seconds after the start command is given, the number two engine at 20.6 seconds, and number three engine at about 22 seconds after the start command was given. Engines will be started uh, shuttle main engine three, two, and one, and they will be shut down in the opposite Engine number one, two, and then number three will be shut down. These engines feature the, the new upgrades, including the Block 2 controllers. All engines went through acceptance testing at the Stennis Space Center in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, prior to being shipped here at Kennedy Space Center. All three engines were installed last November. About 10 minutes after the cutoff of the engines, the external tank will be emptied of its liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Also, those propellants will be returned to their storage tanks at the launch pad for reuse at launch. After engine shutdown, initial safing and propellant drain back, a gaseous hydrogen injection test of the aft compartment is scheduled approximately one and, one and a half hours after the FRF. This four-hour test will assess the hazardous gas mixing and emergency purge effectivity in the aft compartment. At T minus 26 minutes and counting, this is shuttle launch control. Copy, thank you. TCC GLSM 212. Go ahead. 424 is an opera form. Copy. GASM OTC. GASM, go ahead. Form your Star Tracker door open indication status test. Copy and work. And all operators, NTD, countdown clock will hold T minus 20 minutes and approximately two minutes. OTC, CASM. Go ahead, ASM. 
I can give you a step 435. All Star Trekker door open indication is verified off. Copy. And all orbiter systems, this is OTC. You need to verify your program software. Report only if any discrepancies. CDPS OTC. CDPS. Can you verify two consecutive OC concurrencies? That's verified. Thank you. This is Shuttle Launch Control. Countdown clock is now holding at T-minus 20 minutes. Again, this is a built-in hold of 10 minutes in duration. It's a standard hold at this point. ARPS OTC 212. KSC's launch processing team is preparing Endeavour for the STS-49 flight and its maiden voyage into space. Endeavour was rolled out of the Rockwell International Manufacturing Facility in Palmdale, California on April 25th and was delivered to Kennedy Space Center on May 7th, less than a year ago. It has undergone many rigorous first flow testing here at Kennedy to ensure its launch readiness and flight worthiness. ARPS, Today's ARPC, flight readiness firing is one more of those rigorous tests performed on a new vehicle. Many changes have been made to upgrade the Orbiter Endeavour as part of continued improvements to the Space Shuttle. The new features include improved or redesigned avionics systems and updated mechanical systems such as a first ever drag chute for landing. Endeavour is positioned at launch pad 39B. This is the first time pad B has been used since STS-40 in June of 1991. The pad has undergone about $3.5 million and modifications and repairs over the past year. Mission STS-49 is a planned seven-day flight with a landing at Edwards Air Force Base, California. It's a seven-member crew. Commander Dan Brandenstein. Pilot is Kevin Chilton. Rounding out the crew are five mission specialists. Bruce Melnick, Tom Akers, Rick Hebe, Kathy Thornton, and Pierre Thuet. There will be three spacewalks during this flight, including one to reboost the Intelsat satellite to its intended orbit, and the other two extravehicular activities will help to prepare for the assembly and operation of Space Station Freedom later in this decade. Launch Director Bob Seek just received a final weather briefing for today's flight readiness firing, and all continues to look well and for the weather. There are no constraints for the test today. We're continuing with all of our countdown activities today for an on-time firing at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We've got about seven minutes left in this built-in hold at the T-minus 20-minute mark. T-minus 20 minutes and holding. This is shuttle launch control. Termination of today's events. Our constraints, uh, locked drain back, estimated hold time is about four minutes based on the short-term replenish test that we did this morning. 
If a hole is requested and issued between T minus 9 minutes and T minus 31 seconds, countdown clock will be restarted upon successful resolution of that problem without a ghost survey made of all elements. Fire room launch team disable telephone ringers at this time. Ingress and egress of the fire room will not be allowed after resuming the count of T minus 20 minutes until after recycle or critical safety is complete. All personnel not active in the terminal count monitor only, channel 217. All personnel bear in mind that critical post FRF operations will be in progress after a successful run to keep fire room activities and noise to a minimum. And please, uh, for our special testing in the, in the post FRF time frame, please keep activities to a minimum. After T minus 20 minutes, all problems or trends that require a countdown clock hold will, will be reported to the NTD on channel 212 together with your recommendation. After T minus 5 minutes, any hold, manual or GLS, must be accompanied by a description of the problem and your recommendation. The count clock will continue until T minus 31 seconds unless your recommendation is to hold the next milestone. And the milestones are listed on page 624. Uh, the plan that we have this morning will take us uh, through engine startup and shutdown. We'll go through the RSL of the board sequence, the post abort safety checks. We'll go right into sequence 17 for the recycle back to T minus 20 minute uh, configuration. We'll do a quick on that debriefing and then uh, all systems will be released to their normal command channels for uh, system securing. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, uh, if we do cut off after ops transition and prior to SSME 3 start command, uh, that will send us directly into sequence 17. I need to remind the team that there's a DEV out there that has the post cutoff safety checks on it. Please make sure that you show DEV 17-01 in your procedure for the post cutoff safety checks if they become necessary. Are there any questions? So this concludes the briefing. TBC NTD 212. TBC. Are you ready to uh, release JCFM for step 468? Let me double check, please. And all personnel after transition to Ops 101, discontinue all LDB PMU reads for the remainder of the countdown. And FCT, you do have a go for fuel cell purge by the clock. FCT, you copy? NTD, TBC, we can give you 468. I copy. STM, NTD. Thank you. OTC, CGNC. Go ahead. Three point line complete, ready for transition to Ops 1, 484 on work. Copy that. And you have a GMC for me? 142710. Thank you. MTD copy. And all personnel, the countdown clock will resume at 1430 GMT. OTC, CFCP. Go ahead. Yeah, we'd like the next IPR number. What's the problem? Uh, we, we have a uh, suspect fuel cell one coolant bypass valve that may be stuck open. Test train will be SU7 sequence 14. And FCC is NTD, I copied that. CMTC NTD, next IPR number. CMTC, next IPR number. Next IPR number will be 0317. I copy go to CFCP. FCP copies 0317. And QC the constraint is 27, no constraint to continuing this test. Copy. SPE NTD, you concur? And SPE is with you on this one. Okay, thank you. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. Five, four, three. This is shuttle launch two, control. One. Countdown five. clock is now at T minus 20 minutes and counting. Purge of the fuel cells is now underway. And the data processing system engineer will be confirming that the onboard computers are in the process of making the transition to the terminal countdown configuration.
T minus 19 minutes, 30 seconds and counting. All is continuing to go well in our countdown for the flight readiness firing of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, counting down to a T0 at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and a 22 second engine test firing, one of the most dynamic tests that we perform at Kennedy on the Space Shuttle Orbiter. T minus 19 minutes and counting. Pass off transition is complete. Copy that, thank you. The primary ascent software is now in Ops 1, and the backup flight system computer is being configured. T minus 18 minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. SPE, NTD, 212. SPE, go ahead. Yes, sir, do you have any open uh, constraints on the books back there? Uh, negative. We're counting now down to the T minus 9 minute mark. At that time, the clock will enter another built-in hold of 10 minutes. This is another planned and the last of our planned built-in holds for our countdown today. SPE, TPOP, TPOP. Uh, CPOP, this is SPE, did you call? Yes, sir. Um, the valve uh, failure and the uh, indicator that we had before on 610, there's just a T-minus 17 minutes and counting. Use, so we want to look at that a little bit. Uh, LOX also lost a measurement that is not on EMON and is not on their display. That's uh, T prop is NTD and, and uh, C locks and SP. Can you take this 161, please? Absolutely. T minus 15 minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. Engineers are discussing a blown fuse in the mobile launcher platform. However, that does not appear to be a problem for today's flight readiness firing. T minus 15 minutes and counting. The Endeavour launch team is at their consoles in firing room one. Now looking at the liquid hydrogen console. Engineers monitors pressure, temperatures, and flow rates. They keep track of all the vital signs of the shuttle from their consoles here in the firing room.
They also have command capability from these consoles for today's test. T minus 14 minutes and counting. All non essential personnel are being cleared from the danger area at this time in the count. The booster test conductor will start the gaseous nitrogen purge of the aft skirts. This flow of inert gas assures that no explosive or fumbable gases can accumulate in the bottom of the boosters. OTC, CFCP. Go ahead, FCP. Yeah, fuel cell purge is complete, and we're ready for fuel cell load adjust. Copy that. APD, copy. Yeah, APD's got it more. T minus 12 minutes, 48 seconds, and counting. The fuel cell purge and adjust is being conducted at this time. Engineers have a camera tracking system set up to allow them to visually monitor different portions of the orbiter and the tank and the boosters and the engines at various times in our countdown so they can see if there are any anomalies or something that uh, needs to have a closer look. All appears to look well at this point. No problems in our countdown for the flight readiness firing. Clock, we're coming up now on the T minus 12 minutes and counting mark. All is quiet here in Farm Room 1 as we monitor the last few minutes of our countdown today. Coming up at the T minus 11 minute and counting mark. All personnel, 10 minutes possible, T minus 9 minutes and 2 minutes. Shuttle Test Director Mike Lonbach just informed the launch team that we will be holding at the T minus 9 minute mark for a hold time of 10 minutes. TPO, TC. TPO, Yeah, can you go 182 with APU? Sure. T minus 10 minutes and counting. Non mandatory LDB traffic, remainder of count. NTD LPS 212. Go ahead, LPS. I can verify 525 with an outperform of 
T minus nine minutes, 15 seconds and counting. Clock will hold at T minus nine minutes for a 10 minute built in hold. T minus nine minutes and holding. Entity CDLS at 212. Yes, sir, just to let you know, your pending resume time is 1451 GMT. Copy that. Uh, SLMJRPS, NTD 212, activate recorders, please. DRPS, copy. CISL, NTD 212. Yes, ISL. Yeah, activate recorders, please. Uh, would you like us uh, to wait the resolution of this IPR, or do we want to go ahead and kick this off? We have about an hour and four minutes of runtime. Uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. Okay, copy that, and I'll be on 145. Copy. Entity ISL. Go ISL. I got a CMQC, please, on 145. CMQC entity 145, please, at ISL. CMQC entity, you copy? Copy. Copy. Entity safety 212. Go safety. 343, EOD is on site. Okay, thank you. OTC HTV. Go ahead, HTV. Uh, yes, step 558 is complete. Copy. This is shuttle launch control at T minus nine minutes and holding. We've got about five and a half minutes remaining in our built-in hold here. When the countdown resumes, the ground launch sequencer will be in control. The master computer program will issue the commands to perform the final critical task required to put the vehicle in the proper configuration. 
At T minus 7 minutes 30 seconds, the orbiter access arm retraction will be performed. And at T minus 5 minutes, the APUs will be started. These are the orbiter's auxiliary power units, providing hydraulic power for the orbiter. The liquid oxygen tank pressurization and retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood will start at T minus 2 minutes 55 seconds. The liquid hydrogen tank will be pressurized for flight at the T minus 1 minute 57 second mark. At T minus 31 seconds, the ground launch sequencer will issue a go to Endeavour's onboard computers to start their own automatic sequence. Final command from the ground computers will come at T minus 10 seconds, which is a go for engine start. The engine start will occur at T minus 6.6 .6 seconds. The total runtime of the engines will be approximately 22 seconds from the time the first engine is started to the time when the last engine is shut down. Mission Management Team Chairman Brewster Shaw is polling members of the team, getting ready to give his final go for today's test. We will be monitoring the polling of the team here momentarily before we come out of the hold. GLS entity 212. GLS scope. Right, uh, given the, the length of discussion on 161, I'd like to extend the hold here. Cancel pending, please. Copy. That's complete. And all personnel on 212, uh, the hold will be extended. ISL entity. The ISL entity two one two. Anti the ISL. Okay, you had an hour and four minutes of usable tape on on the recorders. That's correct, and uh, we can verify the recorders are activated this time. Okay, I copy. I think we're going to come to resolution here in a not too distant future. So let's just keep them running for the time being. Okay, copy that. NTD ISL. Go ISL. Okay, just to clarify, we have uh, two hours on the MADS recorder and uh, one hour and four minutes on our ops one recorder. Three IU data. Not coming.
This is shuttle launch control at T-minus nine minutes in holding. The team is continuing to talk about the blown fuse in the mobile launcher platform and whether or not that would compromise the test today. So we will be extending this hold at T-minus nine minutes while the team continues to talk and discuss about a blown fuse in the mobile launcher platform. Again, we are in extending the hold at T-minus nine minutes to allow the team to discuss a blown fuse in the mobile launcher platform and whether or not that would compromise any of the testing today. There are no real time constraints on today's test and the firing could occur pretty much any time during the day. Clock is continuing to hold at the T-minus nine minute mark. This is shuttle launch control. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus nine minutes in holding. We're about four minutes now uh, in addition to the hold. We already had it 10 minutes, so we've, we've been in this hold about 14 minutes now. The team is discussing a blown fuse on the mobile launcher platform and whether or not we need to run any additional tests. Discussion is still going on and uh, the concern would be, uh, would any of today's test activities be compromised because of this? Team is continuing to talk. Uh, no decisions have been made. We are continuing to hold in, for an extended time at the T minus nine minute mark. At T minus nine minutes and holding, this is shuttle launch control.
This is shuttle launch control. It appears we will be coming out of the hold shortly and that this problem is uh, safe and will allow us to continue with our test today. SCE NTD 212. NTD uh, SCE uh, yeah, uh, Bob, Bob, on 212 now. Uh. Yeah, uh, SCE is NTD. We'd like someone to summarize the discussion that was going on 161. Yeah, T-Prop's coming up, he's going to summarize. Okay. NTD T-Prop. Yeah, go T-Prop. Okay, we found that uh, the common fuse that uh, has uh, failed, we have workarounds for each of the uh, functions on both LOX and hydrogen, so we're comfortable with proceeding on that. The secondary uh, valve operation, if it were to cause another fuse to blow, we have looked at those functions and feel comfortable that uh, those are also uh, capable of being worked around. It may cause a, uh, a cutoff if the failure is worst case, but we can save uh, the vehicle and drain the vehicle uh, if required. Okay, I copy that. And summarize the hardwire spacing issue that came up also, please. Okay, on, this, on the fuse that has now uh, blown, there are two hydrogen pre-press valves that are on the hardwire panel that are not functioning. In the event that we were to lose LPS and have to hardwire safe, we would be relying on the third pre-press valve to do a hardwire drain if required. And that would be post-FRF. Um, yeah, I copy post-FRF. Now, the other option to that, of course, would be to just sit and go get the fuse replaced with a red crew inhibit that valve from operating, and then, uh, you know, either drain using hardwire or get LPS back up. Okay, I copy. Yes, this has been discussed fully in one point. We're all set to go. Uh, SCE, do you have any other constraints you're working back there? Uh, negative. Okay, I copy. And for the launch team, it looks like we'll go on this one. And uh, on page 642, conducting the FRF staff check, verify ready, resume the count, and go for FRF, say go or no go. OTC. Go. TBC. Go. LPS. Go. Myla. Go. STM. Go. Safety console. Safety's go. SPE. SPE's go. I copy. Launch director, NTD 212. NTD launch director 212. Yes, sir. The uh, problem with the fuse was discussed on the command channel. We all are in sync with the, with the plan that they have in place. Should we, we blow another fuse, feel comfortable with the situation? I have conducted the status check and the uh, team is ready to proceed. Okay, copy. Engineering director. Uh, Bob Engineering's go. I copy. Safety and quality. Safety and quality's go, Bob. Copy. Cape Weather Launch Director 212. Uh, launch Director, we have no weather launch constraints violated. Uh, steady state winds for FRF from uh, zero 09 or zero degrees at 14 knots. Over. I copy. And Ops Manager, Launch Director. And we have no constraints, Bob. You're cleared to proceed with the test. Copy, thank you. And PD, you have a go to proceed. I copy. CGL, I said to resume Thomas. 1503 GMT, please. Copy, 1503. Countdown clock will be resuming momentarily about uh, 20 seconds from now at the T-minus nine minute mark. The launch team has been polled. Everyone is ready to resume the countdown toward our flight readiness firing today. Five, four, three, two, one, mark. Now at T-minus nine minutes and counting. TLS auto sequence has been initiated. The ground launch sequencer is now initiated.
the flight crew for the STS-49 flight of Endeavour is monitoring the test from the launch control center here in firing room one. This will be the seventh flight readiness firing in the history of the shuttle program. T minus eight minutes and counting. We're coming up here at the T-minus 7 minute 30 second mark in our countdown. This is the point where the orbiter crew access arm is retracted away from the vehicle to the launch configuration. The arm is now being retracted away. It can be re-extended in just a few seconds if necessary. T-minus seven minutes and counting. Coming up on one of the most dynamic ground tests performed here at Kennedy Space Center. Flight readiness firing, 22 second main engine test firing at launch pad 39B. T minus six minutes, 30 seconds and counting. TRPS OTC, start APU and hydraulic strip chart recorder. STRPS recorder is running. Orbiter test conductor Roberta Wyrick will be giving a go to perform pre start of APUs. APU copy. T minus six minutes and counting. Activation of the auxiliary power units will come at the T minus five minute mark. The APUs provide hydraulic power to the orbiter and engines, including power for the hydraulically actuated valves on the engines. At the T-minus five minute mark, we will have a command for a go for the start of auxiliary power units. This function will be performed from the firing room at the APU console. T-minus five minutes. Orbiter APU start. T-APU OTC, perform APU start. APU copy. Endeavour features the improved auxiliary power units. They also will be tested in the vehicle during today's flight readiness firing. Once we have confirmation of engine shutdown, they will be run up to high speed for just a few seconds to test them in the orbiter. T minus four minutes, 30 seconds. Copy. Final purge of the three main engines is underway. The valves on the engines are being prepared for engine start. At the one minute point in the count, an engine ready indication will be given. T minus four minutes and counting. A profile test of the orbiter's aero surfaces has started. The flight control surfaces are being moved through a pre-programmed pattern. This is a standard event in a countdown.
The three main engines are being gimbaled and positioned for the test. We have transferred to internal power. Endeavor is being powered by its onboard fuel cells. T-minus three minutes and counting. Just a few minutes away from the 22 second test firing of Endeavor's three main engines. Go for ET, LO2, the liquid oxygen tank is now being pressurized for the test. Retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood is now underway. T minus 2 minutes 15 seconds. T minus 2 minutes. Liquid hydrogen replenishment is being terminated and the hydrogen tank is being pressurized for the test. T minus one minute, 30 seconds and counting. Everything is continuing to go smoothly in our count. Today's flight readiness firing is the seventh for the space shuttle program. These firings are required of all new orbiters prior to their maiden voyage into space. T minus one minute and counting. T minus 45 seconds and counting. At the T minus 31 second mark, we will get a go for auto sequence start. T minus 31 seconds. Go for auto sequence start. Endeavor's four redundant computers have primary control of critical vehicle functions for the remainder of the count. T minus 20 seconds. Sound suppression water will be released on the launch platform. T minus 12, 11, 10, 9. We have a go for engine start. 6, 5, we have main engine start. 2, 1, 0. Engines are now at 100% of rated power. 5, plus 6, plus 7, plus 10, plus 11 plus 14, and we have an abort. And everything occurred according to plan today. Safing operations are underway. It's one, two, and three are now showing post shutdown standby, and we are go for orbiter AP shutdown. Copy. No MPS fire detector shipped at this time. And the abort is planned. Uh, as normal for a flight readiness firing to shut down the main engines. FireX water has been activated. This is a normal standard procedure in the case of an engine abort. These spigots are on the mobile launcher platform. And this is, again, uh, as part of standard procedures to have the FireX water come up uh, anytime we have an engine abort. The team is conducting safing and abort procedures according to plan.
again, uh, we looks like we did have a successful firing of Endeavour's three main engines. This is one of the major hurdles to processing a new shuttle for flight. Kilo's primary safing is now complete, and we are go for transition to D9. Copy that. CGSS report status, emergency egress, temperature, and flame detector. Uh, all the indicators are off, and arm is extended and locked. Copy. Stand tail, water daily status. All three are off at this time. And any deltas in the fire detector status, stand tail. That's a negative. All continues to go well in our safing procedures. Complete. All systems stand by for post support safety checks, page 665. The team will conduct safing and abort procedures according to plan. And in the next uh, few minutes, the external tank will be drained of propellants. The remaining propellants will be returned to the storage tanks here at the pad area and will be used during the launch next month. All appears to have gone well with today's flight readiness firing of Endeavour's three main engines and main propulsion system. Engineers, however, will be uh, analyzing data to determine the characteristics of the new shuttle and if there were any anomalies. There will be extensive inspections of the propulsion system and, ma and main engines over the next several weeks to verify the integrity of the system following the flight readiness firing. There will be a post-test news conference at 1 p.m. Eastern time today on NASA Select from Kennedy Space Center. Again, all appears to have gone well and on schedule. The main engines, we had uh, a normal test firing today of about 22 seconds. And the team is in busy right now performing the routine safing operations. Again, uh, the test firing ended with a main engine abort. This is the way the test team performs the shutdown on the main engines for the flight readiness firing. And that is a normal and standard procedure for the flight readiness firing. Um, the abort procedures are in effect right now and safing is in progress. All appears to have gone well. The flight readiness firing went according to plan and uh, Engineers will be analyzing data gained from this test, which is one of the major, major milestones in processing the new shuttle Endeavour for its maiden voyage coming up next month. Again, there will be a post-test news conference approximately 1 p.m. today, Eastern Time, on NASA Select, originating from the Kennedy Space Center. This wraps up commentary for the STS-49 flight readiness firing. MPL negative. Copy. Thank you. Over to CDPS. Go ahead. Transition to D9, redundant set complete. Copy that, D, uh, NTD. NTD copies, TBC. Welcome to this afternoon's Endeavour Flight Readiness Firing Post-Test News Conference. Our players from your left are Leonard Nicholson, Director, Space Shuttle Program, Robert V. Seek, KSC Launch Director, and Voice Mix, Deputy Project Manager, Space Shuttle Main Engine Project Office, Marshall Space Flight Center. And we'll start off with Mr. Nicholson. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as you uh, probably know by now, there's really not a lot for us to talk about. Uh, everything seems to have gone real well, and uh, Bob and Boyce will uh, amplify on that a little bit. We're going to have a meeting a little later this afternoon uh, where all the engineers will review with us the post-test data. But the indication we have is uh, things went uh, just uh, just as we would have liked them to. And so uh, I think we're, uh, we're on track for uh, launching uh, this vehicle early next month. And, uh, and I might just add uh, the way that the whole team has been uh, functioning here in the last few months is extremely rewarding. And to see this test come off with the, uh, with the uh, uh, degree of professional, professionalism that it has is, uh, in my opinion, uh, quite an achievement. I think the guys down here are doing super, as are the whole, uh, the whole team. So uh, that's all I've got. Thank you. Well, I 
I just add that the flight readiness firing is, is always a, a good test to have under your belt, particularly when it goes as well as uh, this one has. It gives you a lot of confidence in the flight systems and, and based on the real-time data that looked uh, to perform all within spec. We still have data review to perform, but uh, the cloak says it went just fine. Uh, it's a confidence in the team's ability not only to plan and execute a, a non-standard operation, a second one, but also to handle that uh, the engine shutdown at the pad, which is something we always aim for. We hope we don't have to do uh, when we do flight readiness firings. Of course, it's expected, and, and that went well. And the last item is the ground system, because if you recall, the last time we had a launch from, uh, from pad B was last summer. We did a lot of modifications up there. Uh, and as we went through the process of flight rest firing, which is like a launch count, all of those systems worked very well. The only, uh, <clears throat> the only issue we had today was a, a fuse out, in the, um, out at the pad in our ground systems that affected some of our redundant circuits. We did assessment of that during the hold at my nine minutes to ensure that we could adequately safe the vehicle per our standard procedures. Uh, and once we confirmed that, uh, we went ahead as opposed to fitting uh, the fuse and, of course, had a, uh, a terminal count. Our schedule in the near term is to, uh, to finish the, uh, the drain of the tank, and we're going to collect data as we do that, and then we'll uh, go into a, essentially a post-flight turnaround, which, uh, which Boyce will amplify and to verify the integrity of the engine system and the orbiter main propulsion. Uh, in parallel with that, we'll get the payload on board run a, a countdown demo with uh, Dan and the crew, and we're here today to, uh, to participate in this test, and uh, then we'll be looking for a launch sometime in early May. So it's a good one behind us. We're looking forward to the next time we light visions. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Uh, first, I'd just like to say this is a real honor for me to be here in this circumstance, because normally the only time they've asked me to come here before is when we had problems with the engine, and today I can say that uh, everything uh, uh, really went well, and in, uh, in the initial look we've had at the engine data, everything was uh, as we had predicted. So, uh, so what we have uh, ahead of us the next couple of weeks is uh, detailed inspections of the engine. We'll uh, look at combustion devices, turbo pumps, uh, turbine blades, things like that, just to make sure that they went through the 20-second test with no uh, no damage. And hopefully, with that behind us, we'll be ready to launch. Thanks, boys. Let's take questions now. Bill. Uh, Bill, I with CBS UPI for, uh, I guess, for Lynn Nicholson, assuming that the details doesn't show you anything that you don't think you're going to see based on the test. Uh, are you on track then for the seventh? I even heard you guys were talking about trying to reel this back a couple of days to the, to the fifth. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit after the test, and uh, I think uh, uh, where we are is uh, the fifth looks achievable with no contingency and if things go well you we might very well shoot for that uh, we're going to get into the work and see how it goes but uh, that's not out of the question Bill. Irene. Irene Brown with Florida today. Um, would the problem with the valve on the MLP had been uh, would that have been a constraint for launch? The uh, well it, probably not uh, for the it, it's it's really a, a redundant system, a backup system, and uh, per our assessment today, we handle the rules the same as we would have for launch countdown. It was not a launch mandatory item, uh, but we did want to make sure that our standard safing procedures would work even though this, uh, this valve fuse, in this case, that controlled the valve was, was not operable. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate, but the, the rules are the same for safing the system, so it probably would have been go for launch also. Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, AP. Um, Bob, along those same lines, could you explain what the valve was used for in the relationship with the fuse? Well, the, there is a couple of circuits involved with this fuse. Uh, the one that, that would probably be the most noticeable is it would be the inability uh, if the other system failed to, uh, to pressurize the external tank uh, later in the count, which is done at, at minus 157. And the, and the safeguard you have against, if the fact that you cannot 
pressurize the tank is not an unsafe situation, but it would require you to go into hold after that uh, because there are launch commit criteria limits to, uh, uh, to allow you to be able to proceed with terminal count. So that would have been the only consequence. If the other redundant system would have failed, we just wouldn't have been able to launch, but it would not have compromised the ability to save the system. We'll take two more questions here before we go to JSC. Sue? So about time and the Tona Beach News Journal. Could somebody please tell us how many sensors normally on the vehicle? We heard that there were 50 special sensors, but how many in a, are these in addition to what? How many sensors did you have taking the measurements, including these extra 51? Well, let me let me answer that way, and maybe Leonard can amplify. We uh, we monitor on the aft fuselage of the vehicle the uh, the compartment integrity, and we look at it for uh, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, helium. Those are the, the prime commodities, and and these measurements are addition to that. Uh, not fifth one. We had some more <coughs> externally, but we we have inside the vehicle our sensors placed to rather than taking the overall volume of the vehicle we were more specifically looking for leakage from the recirculation pumps for instance uh, engines or the orbiter ED disconnect so they're placed closer to those components uh, and then you can run if you do see indications on one and not the other you could better isolate the leakage uh, in addition to that as you know internally we have the sensors around the the umbilical between the orbiter and the external tank, and uh, and we have further instrumentation there. So it's really an enhancement of the data that's normally available in Launch County. The uh, well, the the total pad number of leak detectors at the pad. I would have to get that for you, but it's it runs be close to three dozen. But that's all around the vehicle and around the uh, the equipment that's external. But inside the vehicle, it's just a handful. Sharish. This is Sharish Dante with the Orlando Sentinel. This is for either uh, Bob or Boyce, I guess. What particularly do you have to do to the engines now to be ready for an early May launch? Well, first thing we do, we have to dry them because of the products of the combustion or steam, and so we, we get it out. And then we just go through our normal post-test inspections, which we do principally with bore scopes, looking at uh, turbine bearings, blades, uh, looking at the combustion devices or any problems with that kind of thing. Do pump torques. Uh, Cap travels it takes about three weeks, you know, concurrent with this that Bob guys are doing with the other parts of the orbiter. And this can be done just as well on the pad as it can be done in the OPF. Well, it's it's not as convenient in the OPF. Or I mean, on the pad is it with the OPF? But see, normally we do all our engine processing offline, so it's separated. You know, in the engine shop and the engine room, so it's, uh, it adds a little complexity just because of the. You know the access and that kind of thing. Do we have a question on JSC? This is Mark Kerr with the Houston Chronicle. What did the test uh, reveal about the uh, hardware outside the main in engine hardware? The the rest of the propulsion system. Were there any any sorts of leaks, or was there anything uh, there indicated beyond normal? The uh, the quick look data review uh, indicated it was uh, a real vehicle right within the family of uh, the other orbiters uh, certainly average or below average in terms of overall leakage both internally and externally and just as a follow-up is there any particular significance to using three new engines for this upcoming flight as opposed to mixing in one new one and uh, to the flight time, is, there, is that any particular reason for doing that or any particular significance for not for doing it or not doing it? Well, when, you know, when NASA bought a new orbiter, they also bought four new engines. So I think it's appropriate for the first flight that, uh, that the orbiter flies with new engines. So from now on, it'll, you know, the way we, we, uh, we switch engines between orbiters, I think uh, this will probably be the last time it flies with these three, three engines. So. That's all the questions from JSC. Okay, Phil. Phil Turner, it's actually a similar question. This is your first flight the new uh, Block 2 uh, mission controllers, and I uh, this is the first time they merged together. How did they work, and uh, any problems getting them into the flow? 
Well, this is the first time they've been used here at the Cape on a test. We've, we've got significant ground test certification testing at Stennis and a lot of us. And uh, no, they worked uh, just like we thought they would. Ross. Ross Cavett, WFTV. Two quick questions. Uh, first of all, are the extra sensors just looking for leaks or any other data? And they got to follow. Well, they're, that's, uh, they're, looking, they're looking for leaks. They're uh, to characterize, if we should get one, to help us uh, pinpoint it. And it's, you know, it's added confidence. That's what it is. And uh, secondly, uh, we chronicled a lot of the minor problems that the Endeavor had was being processed in the OPF. And once it got out, though, everybody was saying it was going as smoothly as any other orbiter that they've seen. Has uh, this kind of just kept that off? Well, it's... It, yeah, the performance in this test reflects the preparation that was done in the orbiter processing facility. It's, that's where we, we make the orbiter uh, flight ready, and uh, that was our goal. That's why it took a while to get there, but uh, the product reflects the preparation it got. It looks great. Dan? Uh, Dan Billow from uh, Channel 2 in Orlando. Uh, Bob, did you have to use any uh, any backup systems at all, uh, I guess in addition to the, uh, to the one on the MLP? Uh, perhaps anything that might not have directly affected today's test, such as an IMU, anything like that? No, we didn't. Uh, on, on, from a vehicle standpoint, uh, uh, all the systems performed 100 percent, and uh, we didn't have to revert to any, any alternate procedures for the whole count. Ross, you want to be cleanup man? Sure. How much fuel um, was burned in this test, do you know? We have them, but I don't have them with them. They'll get it to us and we'll pass it on. Okay. I'd make a guess at it, but I'd probably miss it. Okay, that wraps up the news conference. I'd like to come back to KSC for a brief uh, local announcement. Thank you very much for coming.